Thanks. So the question, will tissue engineering change human nature, leads to a couple questions about definitions. What I mean by human nature is the totality of what makes us people, how we think, and also all the parameters of our physicality. The question then becomes, can tissue engineering change any of those parameters of our physicality significantly? As for a, a definition of tissue engineering, a good starting point is the, is the initial definition proposed in the first paper on tissue engineering in the journal Science in 1993 by two founders of the field, who defined tissue engineering as the development of biological substitutes to restore, maintain, or, and this is important, improve function. And so I think this is maybe a definition that has changed since 1993, and, and we'll discuss that. A typical tissue engineering experiment involves the use of raw materials such as cells. You can see the cells, these are digital holographic microscopes of cells that have very different aggregation states. And their behavior, their eventual fate is defined in part by their differentiation status and where they came from in the body. Secondly, those cells are placed into some scaffold in which they reside. This is a scanning electron micrograph of, of uh, fibrillar type 1 collagen, which you can see forms rope-like structures that, uh, that are very strong in, in tension and provide mechanical strength to the, to the tissue construct. And these can also be synthetic, uh, and, and bioengineers make many synthetic scaffolds that are also biocompatible that cells can reside in. They're typically porous to allow the cells to enter and maintain their, their qualities over, over the uh, experiment. Then the third additive, the third raw ingredient are bioactive molecules, something that can steer the cells in a certain direction into a desired endpoint. And here's insulin-like growth factor one, one of just many growth factors that are used. Not only the raw materials can influence the outcome, but what happens during the culture can also affect the desired endpoint. So you can have a static well plate or essentially a petri dish in culture. But there can also be mechanical uh, stimulation imposed on the tissue construct during culture. For example, here we have a nanoparticle infused magnetic alginate bead. And with an electromagnet or a static magnet that's actuated, it can actually impose stress and strain on the surrounding hydrogel, affecting how the cells behave. At the same time, there can be electrical stimulation. And here we see a chitosan membrane, which is being deposited at an, an electrically active sidewall uh, electrode here, which uh, changes the pH through an ele electrolysis reaction and, and causes the, the chitosan to aggregate. So you can actually build biomaterial structures during culture with electrical stimulation, as well as, of course, uh, stimulating neuronal cells in culture, as Megan uh, indicated in the brain organoid, and cardiomyocytes. But whatever the cell type used, whatever the raw materials and, and culture uh, parameters, the desired endpoint has to, at, at some point, approximate native tissue with one or more functional metrics. Those could be mechanical, they could be metrics of form, or they could have something to do with the shape of the tissue, or also the biomarkers, the proteins on the surface of the cells inside the tissue construct, which ought to, again, be the same that are found in, in the native tissue. I would say that the de de definition has expanded since 1993. It's not that these have to be destined for in, vi in vivo implantation. In fact, there are many cases where, in order to better understand a disease before looking at a preclinical model in animals, in mice, you might use a tissue engineer model to really understand the mechanisms occurring between crosstalk between two cell types, for example, that are important in, in a disease or in pathogenesis of, of a condition. Then again, many tissue-engineered assays are now designed to help trust, uh, t uh, test drug candidates and help screen for drug candidates. And this can be done even with the patient's own cells while they're still sick to find the best drug for them. But also, you know, canonically, it still is the fact that many tissue-engineered applications are guided towards implantation. Here we see an FDA-approved treatment for chondral lesions, holes in the articular cartilage, for example, in the knee. And this involves taking chondrocytes out of the patient, expanding them in vitro for three weeks, and then 
injecting them back in in a porcine-derived collagen scaffold and suturing the lesion shut and waiting to see what happens. More on that later. So in this talk, we'll, we'll define definitions, which we did, discuss three challenges to tissue engineering, some of which Megan alluded to, the plumbing issues, and uh, give some examples of those challenges and also milestones towards their pro uh, progress in, in overcoming them. And we'll also discuss future uh, directions and also the implications for the mutability of, of human nature with these approaches. I wanted to take a moment to say, has anyone seen this image before? The Vacanti mouse or the ear mouse, it is kind of gross. There's some misunderstanding around it. It is a very popular image. It captured people's imaginations. This is not a genetically engineered mouse whose, whose ear grew out of nothing. In fact, they made an artificial mess and mesh and placed bovine chondrocytes in this mouse, which doesn't have an immune system, and then implanted the, uh, the, the scaffold underneath the skin to see if it changed shape over time or what the chondrocytes did. Uh, it was a very early attempt at tissue engineering uh, in vitro. But we know that it's, it's really captured people's imagination because on Etsy you can, you can buy a hand-blown <laughs> glass of Conti mouse with human ear and it, it has, uh, it's very highly rated. So. so images like that have a profound effect on the way the public understands, but, but sometimes not completely. There were some early papal documents relevant to tissue engineering, even though in the 1950s, tissue engineering as a field didn't exist. But its precursors, initial attempts at transplantation of organs and tissues did exist. So Pope Pius II in 1952 made an address to the First International Congress on the histopathology of the nervous system. It's a very cogent address. You can find it on the internet. The Moral Limits of Medical Research and Treatment and in which, in that uh, treatise, he defined three goods that medical research and treatments pursue. And these are the medical research knowledge itself, derived from that research, the individual patient's uh, well-being, and the community's uh, well-being and, and, and uh, prosperity. These goods, however, he stated, are subordinate to the hierarchy of the order of values. And in this treatise, he really laid the moral grounds for, for many uh, uh, protocols that are used today in involving medical research such as confidentiality, patient consent, and, and the balance of harm versus good of a, a medical treatment or procedure. And then on tissue transplantation in 1956, uh, the Pope uh, talked about the acceptability of corneal transplantation from one organ uh, donor to another person, for example, a burn victim, and also discussed the moral framework for transplantation, including respect for the, the the tissue source, the, the organ donor in this case. And this has to do with the, the human dignity that's attached to that tissue even when it's removed from, from the body and, and when life, when, when the soul has departed. So the three challenges that we'll discuss today are balance of oxygen diffusion and consumption in thick tissues. This is the plumbing issue that Megan talked about. In the body, no cells more than 100 microns from a source of oxygen, from a capillary, but if you do that without having those capillary beds in an in vitro tissue, the center will become necrotic and you'll only have living tissue on the edge. And that's a significant challenge. Secondly, recapitulating native tissue mechanical properties is a significant challenge. Our bodies are very tough and to repeat that, to recapitulate that in vitro is, is difficult. For example, articular cartilage. And then achieving tissue complexity at multiple spatial scales is, is a third challenge that uh, we'll discuss today. There are, are top-down and bottom-up approaches in tissue engineering, and this is a bottom-up approach to, uh, to imbue thick constructs with a vessel-like network called prevascularization. This was an early attempt at prevascularization from the lab of my, my PhD advisor, uh, Steve George at uh, UC Irvine, in which the researchers took a human umbilical vein endothelial cells derived ethically from discarded umbilical cords from, from live births at the local hospital. And these cells, when placed on an alginate bead, this biocompatible uh, bead made from, derived from seaweed, and then placed in a thick tissue construct, they spontaneously self-assemble into these sprouting vessel-like networks, which even have lumens on the inside, as you can see from this Flarsen's micrograph. And Craig Griffith, Craig Griffith, a PhD student in that lab, did an initial study showing that 
those vessels need to be stabilized by a layer of feeder cells providing soluble factors that at the time weren't identified, but some of the factors include va vascular endothelial uh, growth factor. And then also, these cells' presence and their location in the tissue can affect the oxygen pressure in the tissue as well. Uh, not that they're transporting, but that they're consuming oxygen, which is important uh, design consideration. In the next step, uh, the researchers implanted these prevascularized constructs in a mouse and found that those vessels, those vessel networks I showed you, were able to connect with or anastomose with the mouse host vasculature. And so when they mixed actually those feeder cells called parasites in with the Huvex, the parasites were able to migrate to and wrap around and stabilize the vessel networks. And if this was done seven days before implantation in the mouse model in a little chamber, as you can see here, within five days post-implantation, those blood vessels in the implant tissue had mouse red blood cells inside of them. So the vasculatures connected. On the other hand, if the cells were mixed and only incubated in vitro one day before implantation, no such vessel networks formed, or anyway, no mouse blood was able to perfuse the implant tissue. And here we see staining of the human vessels derived from human cells and mouse blood inside them as a proof of concept. Later on, uh, Steve George's lab took some of the cells back out of the in vivo model and into a microfluidic lab on a chip model. And what he found is that microvessel networks are not 100% functional. I'm going to try and play this video here. OK, here we go. And so here's the microvascular network in red. And they float a green dye into the microvascular network down a pressure gradient from bottom to top. And what you can see, this is happening a little bit slowly, but you can see, OK. OK, so the video is not quite working. But what you can see is there's, OK, here we go. There's a preferential flow. The green is appearing in some, but not 100% of those vessel networks. This is a significant problem for the bottom-up approach to prevascularization because some of those regions would undoubtedly become necrotic in, in the uh, full tissue uh, implant. So a top-down approach is three-dimensional bioprinting of vessel, microvessel networks. For example, you can use dynamic light patterning of a photopolymerizable dye, uh, hydrogel, that is then dyed and stained with red cells that are, are printed on the outside of the microvessel network. The ultraviolet light forming this pattern will, will solidify the matrix there and allow the rest of the matrix of the hydrogel solution to be washed away. And then uh, Huvex can be implanted all around that vessel network can dissolve the inside and form lumens. And then you can place a second interstitial matrix outside to be the interstitial tissue in the construct. So that's three-dimensional bioprinting. Another way to do this, a relatively rapid way, would be to extrude a vessel-like element in long filaments using essentially 3D printing. And here again, we see an example of that extrusion method. So thermal extrusion will create this filament, which is actually a vitreous carbohydrate. <coughs> then that can be protected with a sheath of a polymer, and then an outside interstitial construct photopolymerized around it. That carbohydrate is extremely soluble, like sugar and water. And so you can dissolve all of the carbohydrate, leaving a hollow lumen inside. That can be then seeded with Huvex, these endothelial cells. And you can see then the two cell types in this confocal micrograph, the red cells, the Huvex. Here's a horizontal cross-section through a, a horizontal vessel, and then a, a vertical cross-section. And there's a junction between these vessels that were simply 3D printed in that uh, cross pattern. And these can be shown to be functional, at least patent, with the flow of blood through them. 
And so whole blood was injected and sort of pulsed through. So you can see all the red blood cells. And there's a connection at 90 degrees, which is not quite what happens in, in, uh, in the body. It's more of a 60 degree angle. But you can have at least short-term functional patency. In the future, though, long-term patency of the vessels has to be shown, demonstrated, and perfusion really remains a key challenge of the whole tissue construct. Eventually, the, the goal would be that this would replace autografts of some sort, which have a lot of donor site morbidity. And while these themselves don't have, in and of themselves, maybe much impact on, on, um, on human nature, as long as they restore tissue function that was deficient, yet if they are used perhaps in, in brain organoids, this could be something that would, would uh, uh, be significantly more complicated to think about. The second issue, the challenge that tissue engineers face is recapitulating native tissue mechanical properties. And these depend upon biochemistry and microstructure. Two examples are in bone, cortical bone, and in articular cartilage. You can see that the mechanical properties of cortical bone are stronger in the longitudinal direction than the transverse direction. And when you see cross sections of the cortical bone, you see why. At all ages, the trabeculae are aligned in the longitudinal direction, and that's the direction that, that you load them on in vivo. So it's difficult to recapitulate this microstructure and the subsequent mechanics in, vi in, vi uh, in vitro. Secondly, articular cartilage, such as the cartilage lining the end of your thigh bone, is also mechanically loaded and has an arch-like structure of its collagen, a cathedral arch, a very strong structure, also a gradient in glycosaminoglycans, which has important uh, implications for the compressive properties, also a gradient in the way in the specific uh, types of expression of proteins on the chondrocytes in the different zones, indicating each of the zones are functionally distinct. And that would then have to be recapitulated in any full uh, tissue engineering model of cartilage. So to develop mechanical integrity, tissue constructs can respond to mechanical stimulation. Here we see alginate discs seeded with chondrocytes are much stronger in their equilibrium modulus 28 days after culture with dynamic mechanical stimulation. We can see that mechanical stimulation would look something like this in vivo, in vitro, excuse me. And in 28 days, we know that that has an effect not only from the change in, in biochemistry, that's visually seen as a more opaque hydrogel here to the left, which is a little bit more like cartilage. And that opacity derives from the extra molecules that the chondrocytes have deposited in the extracellular matrix. Similarly, bone, when you load that mechanically, when you're walking or moving, uh, has tiny uh, networks of, uh, of, of pores through them which exert shear on the resident bone cells. And to stimulate that, to, to recapitulate that in a bioreactor, you can have a perfusion setup where you put marostromal cells that will differentiate into bone-like cells on uh, a, a substrate that's porous, in this case about 60 cents, 66 percent porosity. You can see here from the model that's, that shear stress should be imposed by the flow rates that they put in the perfusion bioreactor, and indeed, those cells were able to deposit more mineral indicative of new bone formation uh, in the perfused versus the static culture. So mechanics guides the tissue fate. And so bio, bioengineers can, can design plenty of these reactors that impose compression and tension and shear on tissue constructs. And they're very good at that. It's not clear, even if you have a very well-designed in vitro tissue, it will, if it will maintain its, its structural properties in vivo. And so here we see that that, that uh, chondrocyte implantation that I showed you early is actually quite disorganized. So there are top-down approaches to design uh, interfaces that have better mechanical properties in cartilage bone constructs. The third, the third feature that I wanted to discuss was tissue complexity. I want to leave you with a couple, uh, I hope, hopefully striking images showing the full complexity of the shape and microstructure of articular cartilage, of the tracheal wall, which composes, is comprised of many such tissues, of the submucosa of the trachea, which has an extensive network of several interrelated, interconnected proteins. 
and to show that even the, the most recent attempt to uh, uh, create a tissue engineered bronchus for a person who had tuberculosis and had uh, a collapse of her, her bronchi had some issues. There was initially some success when removing the cells from an organ uh, donor's bronchus and replacing those with the patient's own cells. However, this patient had to undergo mul multiple revisions over the, the five years following that first tissue engineered implantation of an airway. And so that shows that there are real constraints to the decellularization approach, which retains tissue complexity, but, but nevertheless integration with the host tissue remains an issue. I want to just end with suggesting, showing some more recent church documents that really suggest the, the nature of, of our human nature could be changed by tissue engineering if you attempt to improve upon or perfect our, your nat the natural form of man. That's shown in Veritatis Splendor. A freedom which is self-designing is, is something that the person can't be reduced to, according to St. John Paul II. And in Dignitas Personae, if you attempt to create a new human being, this can be recognized as an ideological element in which man tries to take the place of his creator. So with that, I want to end and, and thank you for listening.